Thank you so much. It's always a great pleasure coming to Busboys and Poets. Uh, I'm forever indebted to Andy and his fantastic team, uh, not only for this invitation, but all of the fantastic work that they've done for peacemaking in these last decades. One day, I know Andy will get the Nobel Peace Prize, um, and he will fully deserve it, as will his entire team. Thank you also for that introduction. As it was said, I'm here to talk about the Obama administration's Iran policy. We've seen how this issue has once again come up on the agenda, on top of the agenda, and the perception that perhaps existed some places that the risk of war had been essentially eliminated by the election of Barack Obama clearly has turned out not to be true. So we're in some ways back where we started, and I think the book uh, gives a good understanding of why we have ended up here. It, the book is based on dozens of interviews, both with uh, key people in the Obama administration, people in Congress and in the Senate uh, who worked on this issue, but also with almost all of the international actors who have been involved in this, ranging from the Iranians to the Brazilians and the Turks, the European actors, as well as Saudi Arabia, Israel, and other states that have a very keen interest and a stake in this issue. So, let me start off by giving you a quote from Obama himself. To the Muslim world, we seek a new way forward based on mutual interest and mutual respect. To those who cling to power through corruption and deceit and the silencing of dissent, know that you are on the wrong side, but that we will extend a hand if you are willing to unclench your fist. Only 12 and a half minutes into President Barack Obama's presidency, he reached out to Iran and the larger Muslim world, offering America's hand of friendship if Iran would unclench its fists. This was a bold move, not born out of desire, but born out of necessity. Uh, as far as we know, having conversations and diplomacy with the autocratic leaders of the Iranian state was never a childhood dream of his, rather, while some believed that Bush war was uh, pursuing wars of choice, Obama had come to the conclusion that peace with Iran was a necessity. The Bush administration followed a policy uh, that essentially said that diplomacy with America's enemies would be forbidden. It was, diplomacy was viewed as a reward, as something that you would only extend to the countries that deserved America's company. And by talking to other countries, essentially, you ran the risk of legitimizing their leaders. And in the case of Iran, clearly, that was not something that the, Obama, uh, the Bush administration was interested in. Whatever one's view is of this ideology, though, the track record is quite clear. During the eight years in which there was no functioning, sustainable diplomacy between the United States and Iran, in which the Bush administration thought that it was punishing Iran by not talking to it, Iran's influence in the region grew exponentially. First, you had a situation uh, in Iraq and Afghanistan, two states which leaders, uh, whose leaders tended to be enemies of Iran. Suddenly, they were now, Iran was now the kingmaker in those two states. Iran, who only had a couple of dozens of spinning centrifuges in 2003, had up to about 8,000 by the end of 2008, when Bush left office. Um, and by challenging an increasingly unpopular uh, America in the Middle East, Iran's soft power throughout the Arab world was also expanding. Against this backdrop, Obama made something that no one else had done before him. He made the promise of diplomacy with America's foes a central part of his foreign policy platform. And talking to the Iranians became the poster child of that platform. What under normal circumstances would have been a losing card, in fact, politically suicidal, now became a winning proposition, precisely because of the American population's rejection of the Bush foreign policy and the neoconservative ideology that it was based on. But time was short. The opening in the American political landscape in favor of diplomacy was limited, and Obama understood this. Iran's nuclear program was progressing. Iran was amassing low and rich uranium, which could be used for uh, the production of nuclear bombs. Pressure from Saudi Arabia and Israel against diplomacy was intensifying and started from the very minute Obama came into power. 
the fear in those two states was that Obama would strike a deal with Iran that would legitimize or accept Iran's growing influence in the region and leave these two states abandoned in dealing what they perceived to be an Iranian threat. The EU, EU was also by and large at one point positive about Obama's outreach, but also a little bit worried about what it could lead to. Would the EU be cut out? And would uh, Obama be so eager to strike a deal that he would actually uh, redefine the West's red lines when it came to the nuclear issue? And of course, hanging over Obama's head from the very outset was the threat of a potential Israeli preventive uh, military strike Iran. A strike or a military engagement that the Obama administration at that time, and continues to do so today, viewed as being absolutely disastrous for the region as a whole and for the US interest. Of all of America's key allies, many of them wished Obama well, but very few of them wished Obama success. And after 30 years of enmity between the United States and Iran, it was very clear to Obama that something needed to first happen when it came to the atmospherics. Because in Iran, the United States was the great Satan. And in the United States, Iran was part of the axis of evil. That type of a discourse, that type of a language, was not conducive for the success of diplomacy. More than anything else, first, the language needed to change. And Obama did a remarkable shift in this stance, in the sense that much of Bush's vocabulary on Iran was eradicated within the first few weeks of Obama coming into power. And I think the boldest move in this regard was the unprecedented video message that President Obama sent to the Iranian people and the Iranian government on the eve of the Iranian New Year in March 2009. In that message, in which he addressed both the people and the government, referenced the government as the Islamic Republic, essentially signaling that the Obama administration was not intent on regime change. He spoke of the need of bringing Iran back into uh, the fold of the community of nations. He spoke of how the many problems between the United States and Iran could not be resolved through threats. A clear departure from the foreign policy of the Bush administration. Iran's response to this was quite swift. Within a day, uh, the supreme leader of Iran, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, uh, gave a speech in his hometown of Mashhad. After first, for about 40 minutes, blasting the United States and all of the faults and all of the crimes that the U.S. had committed against Iran in, from the Iranian perspective. Towards the end of that speech, he left an opening. He said that if the United States changes, then Iran will change as well. This was uh, a small but perhaps a critical opening, but he also signaled something else. The Iranians view that if any change were to occur between the United States and Iran, it had to be strategic. It could not be tactical, and it could not just be rhetorical. Changing the tone was not sufficient. There had to be a change in substance. Until that point, the Iranians argued, there had not been any clear evidence of any substance uh, change in America's position. Only a welcomed and interesting change in the tone, but not enough to get the Iranians fully excited. Now, the Obama administration also knew that it would be very difficult to engage the Iranians before the Iranian elections. The elections were scheduled to take place on June 2012. And already, it took several months to actually finish this new policy. There was a policy review. And then after that, the question was, should the US engage with Iran before the elections or afterwards? There were several different arguments on both sides. But at the end of it, the winning argument became that the US did not want to do anything that unintentionally could affect the, um, uh, the elections, particularly if it would affect the elections in favor of Ahmadinejad. Clearly, from the American perspective, um, uh, seeing him not win the elections was preferable because of the political toxicity, toxicity of uh, Ahmadinejad in Washington. So they didn't want to do anything that could actually help him. But what was real critical about it was that the Obama administration expected that by June 13th, a day after the elections, there would be political clarity in Tehran. There would have been an election, someone would have won, a couple of others would have lost, and the US could then quickly get on with a diplomatic uh, initiative. What they did not expect was that there would be anything 
uh, uh, even the opposite of political clarity because what you had in Iran was an uh, election that uh, a lot of people, in my view, correctly viewed as fraudulent, massive human rights abuses, political infighting at the elite level in Iran that was at an unprecedented level. Essentially